What's up guys, you're watching Life by TCG. We've got a legacy deck for, video for you today. So, as you will know if you're a fan of this channel, I like to brew with Estrid's Invocation and Legacy. And also, as you might know if you're a fan of Legacy, Eternal Weekend is coming up on Magic Online pretty soon. So I almost played a version of the Estrid's Invocation deck in the last Eternal Weekend. Um, that was when I was still trying the version with History of Benalia. Um, in the end, I didn't uh, play an Invocation deck in that tournament. I played a, a standstill Sharknado version instead. Um, not like super seriously, I just tested for a, like one or two days before and then played for fun. Um, again, I'm not super in tune with Legacy anymore, so I'm not expecting to have like a too great result even if I do get to play, but this is just the brew that I would uh, like to share. And I do think it has some... Um, quite interesting upsides in the format right now. So uh, I'll get into the deck list quickly, so I'll just start with the lands. Pretty stock mana base for a um, three color control deck, so like the Jeskai build. So I got the four Prismatic Vista, four Flooded Strand, two Plains, um, five Island. Probably this shouldn't be a Mystic Sanctuary, probably it should just be the fifth Island. Um, two Scorching Tarn, uh, one Mountain, uh, and then one of each of the Blue Jewel Lands, one Tundra, one Volcanic. So that's 20 lands. Then, uh, for the spells, so four Estrid's Invocation, very strong card, I've talked about it before. Um, I'll discuss it again a bit later, so, um, this pretty stock. Spells for a Legacy Control. I have four Ponder, four Brainstorm, four Force of Will, um, four Swords to Plowshares, and then four Prismatic Ending. So in previous versions of the deck, when the Modern Horizon 2 was very new, I think I only had two Prismatic Ending, and I was playing like some Terminus or something as well. Um, but Prismatic Ending is just such a strong card. Um, Terminus is not so great at the moment because there's not a whole lot of decks where you want to sweep. You just want to have like very reliable, immediate answers to deal with things like Raghavan. So um, four plow, four ending. Then onto the more like unique aspects of the deck. Um, four Omen of the Sea. Just the best card to use with Estra's Invocation. Um, so, one thing that people have said about cards in the new format of Legacy after Modern Horizons 2 is that like having your deck built around a weird permanent is much worse because of how ubiquitous Prismatic Ending is in the format at the moment. So, what's a card like that? Um, so, like Aether Vial, for example, is like. A bit worse of a card now because people can just easily answer it um, or if you have a combo built around like grindstone I don't know if that's things, things like that like people are uh, much more ready to answer any permanent and that's true even for permanents that are not combo pieces um, or Aether Vial is not really a combo piece but for example uh, people have identified that card like Sylvan Library for example has become much worse because um, Previously, you could sort of craft your game plan around if you resolved it, it would just stick um, and then you could wait to get your turn back where it would have an effect and then um, you would uh, be able to execute your game plan by paying life to draw cards. Um, so, But now what happens is that if you pay two mana for your Sylvan Library, your opponent can just untap and then pay two mana to exile it with their Prismatic Ending. So... Um, you start you, by by spending two mana on a permanent and then like passing the turn you are sort of like putting the ball in your opponent's court and giving them the initiative to like respond to that in a way that can um not not go well for you i mean it's still just a one for one trade but um like you're giving the giving the opponent the choice effectively of like how they want to play around it so with all of that in mind you could look at a card like Estrid's Invocation and think, um, oh, 
estrogen location is like a weird permanent people have a lot of different ways of exiling weird permanents now because prismatic ending is very popular therefore estrogen location has become worse um, since Modern Horizons 2 has come out but the difference between estrogen invocation and a card like Sylvan Library or say Search for Cantor, which is a card that I used to play in this deck sometimes and now wouldn't for the exact same reason as Sylvan Library the difference between estrogen invocation and cards like Sylvan Library is that estrogen invocation always does something when it enters the battlefield straight away so you play your estrogen invocation it copies Omen of the Sea you scry to draw a card, then pass the turn. So at that point, your opponent can use a prismatic ending on your Estrid's Invocation. And even the other weird thing is that they only need to spend two mana to do that right, because it's cop now it's copying your two mana card. They can um, prismatic ending it for X is only one. So obviously that's a little bit annoying for you, because if you untap with your Estrid's Invocation, that's really strong. But in that exchange where they prismatic ending your Estrid's Invocation, you're still up a card because you lost your Estrid's, they lost their prismatic ending, but you still got to scry two and draw one. So it's not as bad for you as it might um, initially appear. Um, so that's the justification for why I think the deck is still like reasonably solid. Um, in terms of other things, to... Um, help enable estrogen's invocation because obviously you want to be able to have an enchantment down by turn three so you can uh play this as soon as possible and start accruing value i have two omen of the forge um and three spreading seas so omen of the forge um instant speed answers to cards like dragon rage channel and delva ragavan etc um or against cards like um, Mother of Ruins, whatever, like against Elves decks, it's also good to have extra cheap removal. Um, yeah, and then once you start copying it with Estrogen Invocation, you start machine, done it, machine gunning down their board um, versus weird Planeswalkers that can give you some trouble as a control deck. Things like Nasir and Tefuri having the damage option um, at instant speed is pretty strong. And then late in the game, it converts into like a Sulfuric Vortex effect. Once you've totally con taken control of the game, you have your hand full of force of wills or whatever um, then you just start copying it with issues invocation you deal two damage to your opponent every turn until they die pretty straightforward um, then spreading seas so not only is it another thing that draws a card with issues invocation and you do probably want a few more of those than just the omen of the seas um, you can mount like a sort of mana denial plan um, like against an opponent that doesn't have good ways to deal with enchantments you can like spreading seas their cloud post then you like estrus invocation copying the spreading seas on their like other cloud post and you're drawing a card every turn and you're locking down all their mana so big mana decks like cloud post um, have often been like very difficult matchups for blue based control decks because you don't have any good way to interact with their mana ramp and then they just go over the top of you with like big aldrazis or whatever so now you have a different option where you can actually attack uh, what they're doing so that's quite nice um, and then the other great thing about spreading seas right now is that urza saga is becoming very popular in legacy um, and if you spreading seas at urza saga it becomes a saga with no abilities um, so then it just dies immediately so you've basically you gained um, for two mana like sinkhole draw card which is obviously a great effect um, so Spreading Seeds is also like a very strong card in Legacy right now, much stronger than it has been um, historically, just because of how uh, prevalent Urza Saga is at the moment. So that's uh, another reason why I like the Estrid's Invocation as a plan at, uh, right now. Then the last few cards, I have two Force of Negations. Um, I don't know if all control decks are still on the like six force plan right now, but I do like having it just as um uh, a way of interacting more with combo. Um, you could argue that perhaps it's not entirely necessary, but you probably want to have them in the seventy five somewhere. Um, because the other thing is that before the deck played counterbalance. Um, as another thing that was quite good versus combo and also just like value stuff in general um 
the reason why counterbalance is a lot worse now is firstly because of things like if your opponent gets their Raghavan under it, you look kind of foolish. And that is also a card that Prismatic Ending makes much worse. Um, not only is it like a, one of those permanents where you just cast it and then wait for your opponent to do something, um, which is exa exactly what is exploitable by Prismatic Ending, but your opponent can cast their Prismatic Ending with like X as some arbitrary value, which makes it very hard to use counterbalance to stop it. Um, so that's also very uh, bad at the moment. So you could maybe play like a Miser's like one-off counterbalance just randomly for value. Um, you know, you have like Brainstorm to set it up and when you scry every turn with the Omen of the Sea, you can uh, get some pretty reliable flips with it as well. But in general, it's just not a very good card versus the format right now, I don't think. So perhaps not worth playing. Um, the rest of the spells, I have one Detention Sphere. Um, having this effect in the 75 I think is pretty important and just having a main deck is fine. Um, uh, it cleans up all, for example, the Urza Saga tokens because it kills everything with the same name and then when you're flickering it with your Esther's Invocation you can do that at any time that you need to so that's pretty useful versus like Merktide region for example it does the same thing. Um, just a very handy thing to have. Um, then the other main deck cards, I have one Humility, I think this is really key for the deck. Um, as you can see every card in the deck so far is creatureless. Um, that is a relatively unique strength of the list, being able to play Humility because it's so good against everything in the format right now. You could argue that maybe against Delver it's a bit slow, um, and that's fair, but versus everything else like Bad Control, like the, one of the most popular versions of Control, very creature dependent, they have the Endurance, they have Uro, right, as one of their main cards that they're relying on to help them win. Um, versus any deck like Elves or whatever, Humility is obviously great. Death and Taxes, um, like now they're playing a one of like Cathar Commando, I think it's called, to get around Torpor Orb, um, but Cathar Commando can't do anything about this, right, that's all they have left is like two copies of Council's Judgment or whatever in their sideboard. Um, stops all their Yorion, stops their like everything, right? Their whole deck just does nothing. Like at that point, the only card you have to worry about is like Cauldra, maybe. Um, but that's not a. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard to handle with all of the Prismatic Index and stuff. Um, so yeah, Humility really strong. Then the, the other matchup where Humility used to be bad was like spell-based combo. So against Storm, for example, where Humility doesn't do anything. But now, one of the most popular quote-unquote like spell-based combo decks is Doomsday, which is only a spell-based combo deck right up until the point where they actually need to win the game. Um, and then obviously a 1-1 Thassa's Oracle with no abilities is not a very good card at any point, so Humility is not even bad in that matchup either. Um, yeah, it's just very strong. And then the particular synergy with Omen of the Forge and the Estrid's Invocation plus Humility, like, sometimes the problem with Humility is that you would, like, you would get to, like, turn four, and then you would play your Humility, and your opponent would have, like, three one ones or something afterwards, and now you're at a point where, like, well, there's three points of damage per turn that you're still taking, like, now you need to find a way to deal with that, even with still with your humili Humility out, but now all your opponent's creatures are one ones. you can just ping them down slowly with your Omen of the Forge, um, and usually that's good enough to like secure the game. So yeah, Humility is a very good card, I think. And I'm glad that this list can play the um can play it without it affecting itself too much. That's one of the reasons why I'm not turning this into a Yorion deck, even though it like very plausibly could become one with so many weird cards that have into the battlefield stuff on them. Um Yeah, I like it. The, pro the problem with making this a Yorion deck is firstly that you sort of run out of cards to um, have as flicker targets, right? Because we're already sort of after the Omen of the Sea and like maybe you could play a fourth Spreading Seas, but after that like you just sort of start running out of options. Your key piece, Estra's Invocation, you would draw that much less frequently. Um, your Humility would brick um, your Yorion, so that would... That, aspect would be annoying as well. Uh, yeah, so that's the basically why I think that's not ideal, but it's definitely something you could argue for, um, and I don't, obviously I don't think it's that bad, but um, it's just not something I'm going for at the moment. And then in terms of 
um, just having Yuri on as like the free card that you can put in your hand to brainstorm away or whatever. You still have Kahira, right? Because it's a creatureless deck, so you don't lose out on that aspect either. Then the last three cards in the main deck are just like leftovers of what I had before. So one Court of Cunning, one Terminus, and one Jace. Um, I don't. I'm not going to argue that these are correct at all. So, like I said before, like one of these could just be a miser counterbalance. Um, the, you could easily play like the fourth spreading seas um, right now. I don't think it's that bad. If you feel like you're you don't like the court of cutting, you think it's a bit risky in the format right now with like Ragavan Dash and stealing the monarch things like that. You could swap it for like a third omen of the forge, or you play like court of grace main instead, something like that. And yeah, the Jason and the Terminus are just like random cards that I just had left over. So if you have any good suggestions for what you think these last three slots could be, um, then I'm all ears. But yeah, that's the main deck so far. Then onto the sideboard real quick. So like I said, creatureless deck, one Kahira. Um, not bad to just put it in your hand and brainstorm it away as a free card. Or um, you can play it as a win con or to block. It's you know it's totally fine. It's better, probably better than random fifteenth card that you would play instead of it. Um, three pyroblast just as like anti blue stuff. Then uh, two court of grace versus like the fear decks. So anything slower than Delver, basically, this card's a pretty big hammer drop to play. Um, it has great synergy with Estra's Invocation as well, because with the upkeep trigger on this deck, you copy it with Estra's Invocation, and then you become the Monarch before the trigger resolves, so you always get Angels rather than 1-1s. One um, and you're also becoming the Monarch every turn, so you're drawing cards reliably as well, so that's a very powerful uh, interaction. And you could also... Uh, play this main deck as well, it wouldn't be that bad, you just have to be a bit careful whether you think it's not too clunky versus Delva trying to resolve like 4 drop Monarch cards that don't do anything when they enter the battlefield, it's a bit of a risky proposition. Then um, one Surgical Extraction, just as like Miser, Grey Pate, and versus Uro, or any weird deck where you extra uh, extracting pieces is good. Then we have the Enlightened Tutor package, so two Enlightened Tutor one deafening silence as like anti storm or anti whatever combo. Um, I have one stony silence here, but I think right now this should actually be an energy flux. Um, Affinity is really popular, the deck that has the they're calling it like eight cast because it has four thought cast, four thought monitor. Um, against a deck that's so all in on artifacts, obviously, no rod is good or stony silence, no rod uh, is good, but I think energy flux is a bit better. Um, it just pr protects you from. Um, getting run over by the construct starts um, and like the other matchups where you wanted um, stony silence in the past were like were like storm which is a bit less popular right now and also uh, the null rod effect is like pretty decent versus death and taxes as well but now they have um, skyclave apparition to get rid of it so Against death and taxes, you much rather have the humility down instead if you want to have your like tutor bullet. Um, so yeah, so the rather have energy flux than the stony silence. Then I have one seal of cleansing, just as like the um, tutorable thing that can deal with like a chalice of the void or something like that. So because you have so many ways now of killing weird permanents with. Um, Prismatic ending. I used to play two copies of this on the board and now I'm down to one. You could argue that like you don't even need this effect in the 75 because you have the detention sphere in your main deck. But um I still like to have like one copy just as like a safety net, but you could definitely argue that it's unnecessary. Uh one Blood Moon. I like to think of, I like having the one extra piece of non-basic hate to tutor for. You could argue that it can be like a back to basics or something as well, but Blood Moon's a bit better versus Saga stuff, so that's why that gets the nod there. Then uh, one Grafdigger's Cage and one Pithing Needle. Because um, the deck doesn't really have any graveyard stuff going on by itself, you can make the 
cage into like a rest in peace or whatever else you feel like. Um, if you expect a lot of graveyard decks, then you can increase the number of graveyard hate cards in the side, so you can like cut the seal of cleansing for a rest in peace or something like that. I think that's totally reasonable as well. So yep, yeah, that's the list. Um, so there's a uh, like I said, there's a few sideboard slots that are less certain, um, and there are those few cards in the main deck as well. But um, apart from that, I'm a pretty big fan of the Estrid's Invocation. Um, I think the card's pretty strong. So you can think of it maybe as like a that kind of um, expressive, expressive iteration uh, kind of effect that basically all the control decks are playing right now. So it's obviously worse than a card like expressive iteration um, into days because you have to pay three mana on it up front. Um, but otherwise it's like the similar kind of effect because if you want to get the card advantage from an expressive iteration um, you either like need to make sure you hit a land drop off it or you're casting it as like a three drop already um, so yeah you could you could play like one or two expressive iteration in this deck as well just to like have the extra card advantage and a way to like more reliably set up your um, flicker stuff because obviously you need sort of like the A plus B of things. That could be all right actually. Like one, like you could play one or two expressive iteration in the spot, and I think it would be pretty strong. But yeah, that's uh, that's all we have for. Uh, for today. So the Legacy, Jeskai, Estrid's Invocation. You've been watching Life ITCG, signing out.